Our next 30-day intermittent fasting challenge starts on the 3rd of February. If you are looking for a 30-day reset where you can dive into not only your health, but also taking a look at dropping body fat or increasing your muscle mass, increasing your performance in the gym, um, or just in your day-to-day life, getting a little bit more mental clarity, then this program is definitely worth worth checking out. Like I said, it starts on the 3rd of February. Ideally, you guys should be signing up at least that week before, so you've got time to prep because you will need to figure out um, the amounts of foods you're eating. Head across to www.thechieflife.com. You can click into the little tab, which is our nutrition tab, and you'll find a little bit more information around what the 30-day fasting challenge entails. I look forward to helping you guys out on that program. Welcome to the Chief Life Podcast. Where we deliver guests and knowledge from around the world right to your ears. Focusing on nutrition, exercise, health, and wellness. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Guys, what is up? Welcome back to the Chief Life Podcast. I am Matthias Turner, and today I am talking about the reasons you are not dropping body fat. So, I mean, uh, or not losing weight in general. Last week, I actually did a little post, a little blog on this, uh, which some of you guys guys may have seen, but I thought I may as well turn it into words and talk a little bit more about what, (laughs) I guess it gives me a chance to elaborate on what each topic is a little bit more, because realistically, a lot of people come to us and say, hey, I... uh, I have issues with dropping body fat. I've tried everything, but then we start to look at it and they haven't actually tried everything and they're not doing the basics and the basics really freaking matter when it comes to nutrition. So, I'm going to go through these points. I'm going to talk about how it actually said it in the the blog as well as I'm going to break it down a little bit more as to my thoughts and my considerations on this, okay? So, you think that you eat healthy. The amount of times we hear people say, oh, I eat pretty healthy, yet their blood sugar levels are high, their cholesterol is through the roof or their midline doesn't fit the bill um, is a fair say sign to say your idea of healthy is not ideal, okay? So, when it comes to this, so many times people will come and say, yo, like, uh, I'm eating healthy and I don't know why things aren't changing for me. Yet, we look in and they're eating foods that are highly inflammatory. Um, They're constantly going out and uh, it's almost like people look at the majority and then they forget about those slip-ups that they have, whether that's daily, weekly, or uh, or monthly, or weekendly, or whatever it might be. But when when you eat a healthy diet consistently, and uh, say consistently in big words like that, because it needs to be ninety eight percent of the time. Okay, you need to be consistently eating really good quality foods in decent amounts of foods uh, or the proper amount of foods, I should say, to make sure that you are getting the results you want to be getting. Um, so many times I'd have people come and say, hey, eat healthy, but realistically, they're sticking to what the Australian guidelines say. Like for breakfast, I'm having um, I'm having some yogurt or some toast. And then for lunch, I'm typically having a sandwich. with It's a salad sandwich. Though. It's got some chicken on it. Um, and then for dinner, I'm typically having pasta with a little bit of meat. <clears throat> and realistically, that is not a healthy diet. That is not a great way for you and your midline to, to be able to progress forward. And um, not many people, some people can eat that way and get away with it, but not many of the population uh, can actually do that. So, the, the you're the people I'm talking to, the people who uh, are looking for other results, yet they continue to eat the foods that are not favorable for them. When I talk about foods that cause inflammation, um, this is typically down to like your your wheat, barley, your rye, uh, your dairy products, milk, cheese, um, different, even like whey proteins can be a, a big enough effect on some people. Some people respond really well to eating sheep or goat milk varieties instead. And if that's you, then go for it. But a lot of people having dairy consistently, like a yogurt daily or, or the wine and cheese, um, if that's you and you're typically going for the wine and cheese and it's like maybe a daily or, or a weekly occurrence um, and at those occurrences, you're going a little bit hardcore and eating a lot of it, then there's a fair chance you've got inflammation in your body. Alcohol is another one. So, the wine cheese combo is definitely like a smack on the hand. Like, hey, put your hand out. All right, bad girl. Smack it over. Um, but really, Realistically, when we're looking at these foods, the the reasons why I'm saying they're, they're bad is the fact that they do cause inflammation within your body. When your body has inflammation in it, 
you don't have the resources to look into dropping body fat, okay? Um, and we can talk a little bit more about this, but uh, I did a podcast with Dr. Dan Pomper and he made a really good example of if you're not a fat burner, you're not going to typically burn your own fat stores because your body's going to be too reliant on sugars. So, it's going to burn your own muscle stores instead to make more sugar. So, ideally, we do want to be transitioning you over to being a bit of a, a fat burner, when you're eating all these foods that are high in inflammation, high in sugars, and unfortunately, you're typically going to be a sugar burner. Sugar is another one of those inflammation um, foods, the foods that are going to cause issues. And maybe a small amount of sugar here and there is not going to be a bad thing. But when we're eating high amounts of sugar, and realistically, you need to look in and see what has sugar in your diet. Like, if you're, if you're eating a lot of packeted foods, if you're eating a lot of sauces, um, if you're eating you're drinking a lot of packeted food or, or uh, like soft drinks and things, they, these are all going to have high amounts of sugar in them. If you're adding sugar to your coffee, tea and coffee, obviously that is another bout of sugar that you're getting. Um, and whilst on that topic, the, the sweeteners are not that much better realistically because of what they're doing in the body. The way that it reacts to your gut is not that favorable. So, I mean, I mean, all of these alternatives and these easy methods that we've had to make food taste better are not necessarily alternatives and healthy methods for you as an individual to be able to progress. So, it's outweighing. Do your taste buds take, take um, I guess, take preference over the weight? That you're, that you're potentially having or that you're fighting against. So, making those choices. Um, alcohol, dairy, sugar, um, like they are major ones that can create a lot of issues around that gut lining and sorry, around the gut and the excessive amount of weights that you might not be that favorable of or yeah, I guess in that much favor of. So, Caffeine is another one and this is something we've talked about plenty. Like, I mean, we've talked about sugar. We've talked about caffeine. Head back and check out those podcast episodes. Episode 101, I think, is caffeine. Episode 103 or 105 is sugar uh, where we kind of dive a little bit deeper into what what those things do and how they can affect the body. But if you say that you eat healthy um, and you're not willing to change anything, then I wouldn't expect a change from you. So, realistically, we do need to trial new things to see a difference. Uh, Whilst I'm on this, people how to best say this maybe this isn't the best time for that i was going to say uh uh, talk around um let's talk about expectations around what your body looks like and what your body type is so there's different types of bodies there's endomorph ectomorph and a mesomorph ectomorphs are your ones that are the tall skinny string beans mesomorphs are the people who they can blow out but realistically they put on muscle easily and the endomorphs are typically the body shapes they call as like an apple or a pear if you're an endomorph there's no way that you're ever going to end up looking like say tia claire toomey it doesn't mean that you can't eat incredibly well diet incredibly well and end up with a variation of a six pack but someone like Tia Claire who's typically going to be probably a mesomorph the muscly type is is not like to look like her you'd have to completely jump out of your body and jump into a new body is what I'm trying to say realistically okay so setting expectations around How your body looks and where you want to get to is a big thing. If you're typically looking at bikini models who are tall string beans and you're a shorter, wider individual, you're probably never going to have the body type that they have. Yo, team, I am back. Quick interruption with the phone call. My phone is now on airplay mode because that was a full rookie mistake from my behalf. Uh, But that's kind of hit that, that first point home, I think, a little bit. Realistically, it's about setting expectations around your body type. But when you say you eat healthy... It is worthwhile trying out different things because potentially what you're trying is not working for you, especially if you think that you are trying um, or if you're healthy and you're not changing anything. Nothing in your body type is changing. Um, You don't track your food. This is point number two. So, we're not saying that you have to track food forever and ever, but you should go through a period of time where you're tracking how much food you're eating via weighing and measuring and or macro counting, which requires weighing and measuring. You can't just do macro counting and guess it. You have no idea how much fat is in a handful of almonds or how much protein is in a breast of chicken. So, how are you ever meant to know if you've hit your daily requirements or blown them out of the water? So, that that was from the blog that I've written but realistically that that pretty much like it sums it up if if you don't know how much is there it's like if your fuel gauge is broken 
and you've got to drive from Sydney to Brisbane and you have no idea about when you need to refill or how often you need to refill or when you're going to run out of fuel. Sometimes you might stop and you might fill the car up and you keep filling it and all of a sudden you've overfilled it and we splash out a little bit of extra. That's like extra adipose tissue. Or if you can imagine you had an endless amount of uh, like every time that you overfilled the, every time you overfilled the car, a new jerry can popped up on the side of the car, then this is what's happening essentially when we're overeating food. <clears throat> when it comes to weighing and measuring, it might not be the most favorable thing for everyone to do and it might seem a little bit tedious, but if you have a bit more of an understanding as to how much weight goes onto the plate and how much of each different macro goes onto plate, then you start to understand a lot more about what food's value is. And what I mean by that is a handful of almonds, like how much fats does it have in it? What else does it have in it? It's actually got protein and carbs in there. So, when it comes to it, like how much of each macronutrient are you getting? Did you know that um, some meats have carbohydrates in them, that some fats, like depending on what you're having, some will be straight fats, whereas other fats might have things like proteins and carbs in them, like we've just talked about uh, with almonds, say for instance. So, Realistically, I think doing uh, whether it's a week or two weeks or maybe even every other day where you're tracking some food can be really, really valuable for you as an individual to figure out exactly how much you should be eating. The other thing with that is that you typically then find out exactly how much food you should be eating you as an individual um if you if you go with a personalized approach like something that the chief life do is a personalized meal plan or a personalized macro consult where we break down exactly how much food you should be eating and gift that give that to you as as a either a meal plan or as macro amounts with with food broken down to show you what that looks like so that realistically is something that I think everyone should should be doing and getting a greater understanding for. Um, the other good thing is that that starts to give you a greater understanding of when you're having those slip-ups. So, say, for instance, you're having a wine each night. If you start counting that into your macros, you start to see how much that is valued at. If you're having wine and cheese every weekend and you actually weigh the cheese as to how much you're having, like that starts to show as to how much calories you're consuming and potentially why you haven't been dropping any body fat or any weight. Um and I mean, that can, can, can that story can continue on. Like if you're eating ice cream every night or you're eating it once a week, but you're eating a whole tub, like how many calories are you consuming in that that hit? And is that potentially like you're, you're great during the week, but then on the weekends, you absolutely just blow it out of the water. Um, no wonder, no wonder then that your body's not dropping body fat or by, the, by Friday every week, you're looking pretty good. Then by Monday, all of a sudden, it, you've gone back to square one, if not past that. Um, so, I would highly recommend tracking your food to some extent, uh, at least for a short amount of time and revisiting it, Just not just um, not just saying, okay, I have an understanding for it now. It's how do I revisit that and see if I'm on a good level or not? Am I still eating the right amounts? I know, uh, for instance, Ace and me, whenever we weigh and measure, it's always on point. Whenever we eyeball, we tend to get bigger portion sizes. Gradually, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, step number three, you eat too much of the wrong macronutrient. We typically find that most Australians overeat certain macronutrients. Carbohydrates are often the culprits as we, uh, as who doesn't love a breakfast filled with cereal, bread, muffin, or morning tea with a wrap and a sandwich for lunch, uh, some fruit in, in the afternoons, and a pasta dish or pizza for dinner. But if that's what your diet looks like, then there is a fair chance that you fall into the category of overeating carbohydrates. Some people can get away with uh, with higher carbohydrates. That's completely fine. If you're a carb-adapted person, you do well with carbs. But these people have typically done step two and tracked their foods and found out exactly how much they respond to. Um, if you're, uh, uh, say, a CrossFitter doing multiple sessions in a day, <clears throat> multiple sessions in a day, then maybe you're going to need a few more carbohydrates than the regular person. If you're an everyday Joe going in for one hour class, maybe once a day, uh, five days a week, then you're typically not going to need as many carbohydrates as someone like Rich Froning or Brent Fikowski or someone like that who is doing a high amount of work, Matt Fraser. Um, realistically, we need to separate the difference between who you are and what you do in your day compared to what a major athlete is doing and how much they're doing in their day. Um, if you are not 
a full-time athlete, then there's a fair chance that you need to be looking and monitoring your carbohydrate intake. Um, we typically see that people are either over or under eating on the protein side of things, like men particularly overeat, women particularly undereat, and carbohydrates are usually too high, fats are usually uh, in somewhere in between, either too high, too low. Um, and so, finding a balance for both of those or all three of those macronutrients is obviously very, very important. So, figuring out how that works for you um, is always a, a tough thing to do, but that's where companies like ourselves and other companies come into play for helping people to figure out exactly how much you should be eating of each macronutrient. Number four, your training intensity isn't there or you train too much. This is a fine line. So, I'm going to talk about that. So, I'll read it and then I'll get into my, my points. Training is important for muscle growth, but, uh, but so is sleep for recovery. You should try to train... Uh, with the utmost intensity, get in, uh, sorry, get in, get it done and get out. Then let your body recover. So, what I'm talking about here is that when we sleep, that's when we actually get our muscle growth or when we actually recover the body, when we actually get our benefits from being at the gym. You obviously have to go through the, the, the works when you're at the gym. You have to go there. You have to do the things. So, many times I'll see people come in and they talk the whole way through their session or they barely break a sweat when everyone else around them is sweating sweating bullets like realistically it does come down to working hard some people come into the gym two or three times a day and these people are typically over over training under eating under recovering if you are training more than like every hour that you train you need to get an extra hour of sleep in a night time um when it comes to to your food you need to make sure that you're eating enough to be restoring the muscles restoring the glycogen restoring everything that you've utilized within that hour training session so people who think that they can simply train more and eat less this is a faulted system um if it means that you are going to the gym in the morning doing an hour-long class in the afternoon you're doing a 5k run uh and then you're doing some crunches or push-ups or something before bed as well and you're only on 1200 calories in that day like eventually your body is going to fall apart if it hasn't already or it will hit a plateau and you'll just stop seeing the results and realistically, there's going to be a level where your body kind of finds its happy medium and it just likes to stay around that weight and that's all right. Um, but realistically, we need to, I guess, sorry, we need to be realistic with ourselves about whether we're at that stage or not. Like if you've hit a plateau, is it because the things that you're doing is actually not not well calculated and it's not going to help you out anymore? Or is it, is it because... Um, like you, you're actually at your body's kind of limits right now and without maybe decreasing some muscle mass, you're not going to get any leaner or sorry, any smaller um, decreasing muscle mass unless you are a huge individual like a, a, a muscly individual is never a great idea because muscle is the, the um, organ of longevity. The more lean muscle mass we have, um, it is really beneficial for us as individuals. So, it... Um, realistically when people die from cancer or something it's typically because they've got not enough muscle not because the cancer itself actually killed them so like obviously there's a mix of the things that are going on in their body but that is typically the thing that actually gets to them so make sure we have a fair amount of muscle is actually really really important um so when it comes to training i, I feel like and i i have been a person who has overtrained in the past i had the the whole concept of really wanting to be a competitive athlete and i went down that route and realistically i did well in that route but now that i'm training less but hitting it with maximum intensity i'm almost fitter I would say I'm probably fitter than what I was back then. The only thing that's down right now is my strength and that's because I don't focus a heap on strength. Like I do a strength piece a session and that's it. Like, uh, sorry, a strength piece five days a week, four days a week. Pretty much four days a week. Wow, I only do strength four days a week. The rest of it is, is Metcon. So, six days of training, two days of pretty much Metcon. Sometimes, occasionally on the Wednesday, I might do some weightlifting. Sometimes on a Saturday, I may chuck in a barbell. Um, but the, the rest of the time, it's mainly conditioning. And realistically, my strength is not that far off. And I owe it to the intensity that I put in when I'm doing some squats for strength i make sure that i'm i'm hitting those bad boys either at the percentage that it should be at or if it's a 5rm i'm really grinding like i'm making sure i'm working hard um, with good technique 
when it comes to actually hitting the workout, it all comes down to putting absolute absolute intensity into it so you get the most out of your body. If you get to the end of a workout consistently thinking, I should have done more, then you need to start changing something with probably your mindset when you're in the middle of of a training session. Um, If you're able to keep your breath and talk the whole time during your session, then I would definitely say that there is something once again going on with your intensity levels whilst you are training. Number five, you're not sleeping enough. Sleep is key to recovery and how your body functions optimally. Sorry, and how our bodies function optimally. If you're not sleeping seven and a half hours a night or more, you're probably not recovering and your body is probably in overdrive. So, it can't even begin to focus on utilizing fat. Um, Utilizing fat as a fuel is what I mean there. So, realistically with this, if you're not sleeping seven and a half hours a night, you should be getting a nap in. If you're not getting a nap in, then I'm sorry, but your body is probably not going to be um, functioning optimally. There's like a really minimal percentage of people about maybe 0.5% of um, of the population in the world <clears throat> that have a gene that says that they can sleep four hours a night. Probably realistically, that's, that's not many of the people that are listening to this podcast or it'd be like one of the people who are listening to this podcast. Um, I don't actually know what the gene is called, so I can't even follow that up for you, but follow it up meaning with a, an actual stat but realistically you should um you can jump on google i'm sure or you can get your genes done at something like 23 and me and then you can send it off to a geneticist someone like dr anthony J, who can go through your genes and say hey based on your genes this is um like you should be sleeping this much and when you do training you should be doing this style of training you're going to respond better to this this and this um those things are, are quite cool when you're looking at what a geneticist does and uh or, or what they say but realistically when it comes to it most of us need to be sleeping seven and a half hours a night um if you guys haven't checked it out we've got a a pretty pretty pumping youtube channel uh we've been doing quite a lot of different videos and something i did recently was a three part sleep series on um on youtube so head across the chief life Sorry, go to YouTube and just search The Chief Life and you will find our YouTube channel. It's got a heap of different recipes on there. Realistic, oh, sorry, recently, what we've been focusing on is um, pretty much different educational videos talking about everything from sleep to stress to ashwagandha and different herbs. Fertility is another one that's coming out soon. So, um, yeah, we, we've kind of been diving down the rabbit hole a little bit there. So, that could be very, very worthwhile for you to check out. But the idea of that and we've also done the podcast on sleep with um with dr michael bruce they were great as well and there's so much you can do around your sleep to make your sleep better um if if you have trouble sleeping then going ahead and following those videos following what the youtube channel or sorry what those podcasts say can really transition your lifestyle around quite quickly because sleep is really a way to unlock everything Number six, you're, you're too stressed <clears throat> and probably putting your body through more stress with supplements like caffeine, with daily exercise and with your go, go, go lifestyle. Um, stop, breathe, think and allow yourself time each day to just be with your thoughts and practice some form of meditation. So, uh, realistically, that kind of says it for it. Like, if if you have a highly stressful job, I mean, realistically, the way that the world is now, we are uh, there's no no wonder why most individuals are so stressed or so depressed because we have so many things coming at us from so many different angles. The the costs of rent is going up, the costs of living is going up, and that creates issues. Um, which then creates more stressed out individuals like our workloads are typically going up because some people are absolute grinders and can get through a whole heap of work whereas others don't don't function that well with the jobs that they're in so finding if you're not going to transition your job it's about figuring out how you can better better get through your day without so much distraction and making sure that you are getting the things done without so much stress being loaded up on top of you Um, stopping and breathing is a massive one we can up and down regulate your stress based on the way that you breathe so if you are constantly mouth breathing as I am right now as I'm talking but if you're constantly mouth breathing what happens is you're typically in a short shallow breath which puts you into your fight or flight mode if you can do longer deep inhales and particularly through your nose you're typically going to 
activate like your rest and digest your parasympathetic nervous system uh, and that's where we want to be more often if you can breathe through your nose regularly throughout the day if we can re- reduce your stress things like caffeine and exercise a uh, uh, so exercise can be a good stress it, it typically i'm not going to say remove exercise because it is actually really really good for you the benefits outweigh um the negatives if any however if you're training too much that's when we need to look at maybe reducing the amount of exercise that you're doing caffeine is a stressor if you're a highly stressed individual and you're in you're in in taking more caffeine um then realistically you're just adding more stress to your body so it's a stressor that we can control by removing the amount of caffeine that we're having okay swapping that out for a decaffeinated version all of a sudden you're still getting a similar response or the similar um habitual factor just you're not getting the stress that comes with it so um yeah trying to reduce your stress as best possible bringing in some form of meditation each day can be a really good way to reduce stress so it just kind of helps you with um i guess piecing together the things in your mind a little bit easier or being okay with noise and figuring out how to focus on the things you need to focus on the most so either a guided meditation or getting out in nature or finding something that works well for you so you can actually do some form of meditation where you're quiet and silent in your mind um or you're you're noticing your thoughts as such that can be really really beneficial for you Number seven, your hormones are out of whack. Years of unfavorable amounts of stress, unfavorable amount of eating can lead to dysfunction in the body. This can be reversed without medicine. It does take action, but everything in life that is worthwhile does take action. So, what I'm talking about here is that the more stress we get, um, the more cortisol we have, the more cortisol we have in the body, the more things can start to get messed up. Pretty much with males, the more our cortisol goes up, the, the more our testosterone drops, which is kind of crazy. But if your um, sexual hormones are out of whack, then probably more than likely a lot of your hormones are going to be out of whack. But <clears throat> when it comes to it, we do really need to look into what's going on on a deeper level and if you literally have tried everything you've tried dieting you've tried uh, like you're sleeping optimally you're 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 really looking into your lifestyle and you're doing everything the way that you should be doing then it's a good chance that we need to look at your hormones and actually test out what's going on through either a a saliva test or or a blood test we can check out what's happening with um with the different hormones and see what is going on in the body um like you're so stressed and your your thyroid thyroid is starting to mess up or um you've got such high levels of estrogen or low levels of testosterone in the body that it's creating an imbalance and these are things that we need to look into and have a, a deeper dive and say hey this is what we need to change these are the things that are creating creating issues in your life and this is how we need to be able to progress forward with it um, if that's something you wanted to do, then we do do this, uh, the tests through the Chief Life. You just need to book in with Belinda Moss via a consult. <clears throat> so that consult, um, it's about an hour long and she can go through, she'll do a full health history check on you. And then she'll also, if needed, get the further response from the different, um, different tests needed for you to be able to progress forward and do that. Number eight, and this is a, a benef- uh, sorry, a bonus one that I've just added in for this. It's you drink bulk soft drinks or diet soft drinks. Um, these are horrible for you and they definitely cause weight gain, in particular the, the uh, diet soft drinks. The amount of people that I've come across recently that are drinking Pepsi Max because it's zero sugars or zero calories or whatever BS they try and market to you is ridiculous and these um, different diet soft drinks are absolutely horrible for you and what they do for your body. The, the way that they respond in the gut from memory is that they make your gut f- think it is bigger than what it is so it continues to feed and continues to process the foods that are that are coming through continues to push that through uh hence why you start to build up fat and continue to to have more and more fat it's something along the lines of that don't quite quote me there but um i did actually do a diet soft drink podcast maybe a year ago or so they kind of delved into this, but um, realistically, these these are not favorable drinks for you to be having. Ideally, you're getting most of your liquid from water. If you're going to be having a fizzy drink, maybe it's a soda water or maybe it's a Fit Aid. 
or something of the sort that um, is actually a, a kombucha, say for instance, something that's favorable, something that is good for your gut lining, for your gut, sorry, in general, not something that is going to throw things out of whack. Um, it's kind of crazy. Like you can literally get cola flavored kombucha, uh, which is probably 100% going to be healthier for you than having, say for instance, a Diet Coke. So, I don't know. It, they've really made it that easy for you to choose the healthier options. It's just about you having the willpower to say, okay, today I'm going to choose the kombucha route rather than choosing the Diet Coke, Pepsi, whatever route. Um, and I know these things can be addictive. So, it's about making a step, making a start, slowly removing or reducing, um, swapping it out, changing the habit and then progressing forward from there. So, team, that is it. That is a little wrap on this week's podcast, diving into eight reasons why you're not dropping body fat or body weight in general. I think it's really important to kind of get clear as to what you're trying to do with your goals, whether you're trying to actually drop weight or body fat. Because if we're trying to drop body fat, we don't want to see much muscle getting lost in that that um, in that route, I guess. But realistically, depending on where your where your body is at. Um, we do need to make a change in some diet. And if you have never done any form of weighing and measuring or actually looking into the foods, different food groups and different foods that cause inflammation, then I'd highly recommend getting onto that. Um, if you want some help with that, if you want us to help you or hold your hand during that process, that's what our meal plans really look like. We go through a bit of a detox phase to start with. It's kind of like our phase one protocol. We take you guys through a detox where you start to kind of find out, oh, realistically, it shows you the foods that you should be eating eating um, to, to give you your best outcome based on your size, your goals, your daily exercise output, all of that. Uh, we can't take all that into consideration. We put you through a little bit of a detox. And then our phase two product is where we start to take you guys through, hey, this is how we reintroduce different foods. This is how we look at making things a little bit more convenient with like an updated meal plan. From there, our phase three is our macro consult where we're talking more about showing you how to fish. So, this is realistically when we kind of say, hey, here's the macros. This is what a day of these macros look like. Let's go out and follow these for a few days. And then when when you're ready, let's start to change these around. Let's start to add in your own food, some of your favorite foods. How do we build some of your favorite meals into this day of eating to make sure that you have an understanding of what macros are and how much they're worth and utilizing programs or uh, like yeah programs apps like my fitness pal or something of the sort to to track those macros can be really beneficial um but realistically if you kind of wanted all of this phase one through through to phase three this is what our nutrition coaching program looks like where we kind of take you guys through a personalized meal plan we call you up weekly we have talks about where you're at and what we need to be doing to make sure that you're holding yourself accountable um and you've got us to be accountable to as well but uh, those weekly check-in calls can really kind of i guess we can change things around as needed for your lifestyle so say for instance myself i'm doing a competition in two weeks time so now i'd be looking into what i need to be changing with my nutrition coach over the following weeks leading into this competition um and so week by week we can really dive in with your nutrition coach onto the things that we need to be doing to make transitions for the better for yourself um but yeah team that's it from me if you have any questions, please reach out to me, maddie at thechieflife.com. Uh, I'd love to kind of hear some feedback, actually. If you guys, uh, whatever platform you're listening to us on, I would love to hear uh, maybe what your favorite podcast has been recently or if that's not something you want to answer, hit me up and tell me what you'd like to hear more of. Um, but yeah, that's it from me today, guys. Peace out. I hope you're having a fantastic day whenever you are listening to this. Um, and other than that, eat healthy, stay clean, love life, and uh, go live a little. Visit thechieflife.com for all of your nutrition coaching needs, your own personalized meal plan, as well as how you can get involved with one of our seven pillar retreats.